Funding for This is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. Back in the day, the hip-hop music scene was full of crews, groups of like-minded MCs, rappers, DJs, and even dancers coming together to share a common vision or sound. Here in Nashville, the crew 61 Tribe is doing everything they can to represent their brand of hip-hop here in Music City. Consisting of 16 members, all with their own unique style, 61 Tribe has been making their own opportunities when the industry in town did not. Later this hour, we'll meet the founders and three members of 61 Tribe and hear how they take the concept of strength in numbers to a whole new level. But first, since 2018, Nashville's Community Oversight Board has independently investigated civil complaints of police misconduct. Now a new law passed by the state legislature and signed by Governor Bill Lee abolishes such boards in Tennessee. With the law set to go into into effect on July 1st, the boards in Nashville, Memphis, and Knoxville have been looking for a path forward. WPLN's general assignment reporter Rose Gilbert has been following the story, and she joins us now. Hey, Rose, thanks for being here, and welcome back to this is Nashville. Hey, Khalil. Always a pleasure. Yes. Okay, so just for a little bit of background on this, how did Nashville's Community Oversight Board get started in the first place? Yeah, so as you mentioned, you know, it started in 2018. Uh, There was a referendum um, to create the board, uh, and it was very popular. Over 134,000 Nashvillians voted for it, and it won uh, by 20% margin citywide. And to give you a little context here, uh, this was following the 2017 police killing of Jacquees Clemens and Daniel uh, Hambrick in, in 2018. So there was, you know, an increased appetite for more accountability for, you know, Nashville police. Um, and the original conception of the COB is that it was this place where, you know, civilians could bring, uh, you know, concerns about police misconduct and have an independent body investigate those claims. So that would be outside of, you know, I, you know, internal measures that the police already had. Now, on Friday, you reported that five Metro Council members have filed this ordinance to reconstruct Nashville's Community Oversight Board as a less powerful review board. What does that mean? Yeah, exactly. So um, those five council members are, uh, you know, Zulfat Suara, Sean Parker, Jeff Syracuse, Brickley Allen, and Alicia Porterfield. Um, And they introduced this proposal to remake the COB, but to understand kind of how that, that that's a response to this new law you mentioned um, that was passed by the Tennessee state legislature that functionally abolishes oversight boards as we know them currently. Um, and that was signed into law last month by uh, Governor Bill Lee. So tell us more about how this law, how it really impacts the community oversight board here in Nashville. Yeah, so specifically in Nashville, um, there are... I would say three main impacts to think about. Um, perhaps most obviously, it reduces the number of members on the board from 11 to 7. Um, the next thing is that it uh, would allow the mayor to appoint all the board members without outside input. Now, this is kind of a big deal. Uh, the community oversight board you know, prides itself on that community element. And uh, the majority of board members are appointed through petitions from community organizations and individuals. Um, mayor gets to appoint one person. Council gets to appoint two. Um, so that would be a, a pretty big departure from how board members are currently appointed. Um, and the third thing is it, you know, would remove their independent subpoena power. You know, right now they have the power to subpoena documents without asking anybody else to do it for them, mm. which kind of gives their independent investigations a little more tooth. So okay, circling back to this Metro Council ordinance, what are they trying to do there? Yeah. So the first thing to note is that um, this new law, if it, you know, when it goes into effect on July 1st, it dissolves the boards, but it allows local governments to create replacements. It gives them 120 days to do so. So if Metro Council didn't file an ordinance to recreate the COB as a review board, it would be gone completely. Mm. So first order of business is to make sure it exists in some capacity, right? Um, And the second thing that it tries to do is that it tries to preserve as many of the oversight board's original functions as possible, even if it's a review board. So um, number of members on the board would still decrease. But one of the things that it does is try to carve out a way for community input to still be kind of the biggest deciding factor and who's on there. So it it would allow for um, the majority of board members to still be appointed through community input. So that's one big thing that it does. 
Uh, the next thing is that it would allow uh, the board to request subpoenas through Metro Council. Mm. So even though the board wouldn't be able to subpoena things independently, they can go to Metro Council and say, hey, can you subpoena this for me? And the council can do it. So that would kind of give them some of their power back as far as investigative ability. I'm interested in how this new law impacts other police oversight boards. And I'm thinking specifically about the one in Memphis. What, what can you tell us about that? So Memphis is interesting. It's a little bit different than Nashville. Um, one thing to mention is that the board in Memphis is a lot older than, than the one in Nashville. They've had there since 1994. Mm. So they've been doing this work for a while. Um, and the second thing is that they are actually already a review board. Um, you know, they're a civilian law enforcement review board, not a community oversight board, which makes it a little more complicated to understand how this law will actually impact them, if at all. I was actually on the phone yesterday with uh, Pastor James Earl Kirkwood, who's the head of that board. And, you know, I asked him, how is this going to impact you? And he said, we would both love to know that. Mm. Um, he's kind of been on the phone with their attorneys for the past couple of weeks, waiting for a more definite answer. So that's a little up in the air. And the reason that's so important is because, you know, the, the Tyree Nichols case still hasn't been resolved yet. And that case, which you know drew national attention, um, is something that no one wants to see fall through the cracks. So we're kind of waiting to see how the board will be involved, will be able to investigate if they'll be able to investigate. Mm. How does this story fit into the bigger picture of Tennessee's political landscape right now? So I would say that the tension between the state and city governments has been maybe the dominant theme mm -hmm. of uh, politics in, in ta Tennessee and Nashville for the past year, uh, you know, from the Republican National Convention to the efforts to downsize the Metro Council to the Titan Stadium deal. I think um, most people would add this uh, law to that list um, of, of moments where they feel that the state government has maybe overstepped their role or, or kind of really started meddling in Nashville politics, perhaps in a punitive manner. Um, and so just to go back to that, that referendum, I mean, it's worth noting that the COB is something that Nashvilleians voted for in Nashville, right? And something that a lot of people have been quick to point out, both in uh, comments we've gotten from listeners, keep sending those in, guys. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, what I've heard from board members is that, you know, this bill was the primary supporters are uh, elected officials from Knoxville and Lebanon. So there's kind of the sense of like officials who are not from Nashville, who don't represent Nashville, kind of creating this bill that disproportionately impacts um, Nashville, Memphis and Knoxville, where those boards exist. All right. So what's next for this story? Well, First and foremost, the first reading of this Metro Council proposal to reconstruct the COB is on June 20th. So I'll be keeping an eye out for that. Uh, the other thing is I did speak to board member Alicia Haddock on Friday, and she said that nothing is off the table right now as far as potential legal action against the state to try to preserve the COB as it currently exists. They do have independent counsel, but there have been no lawsuits filed as of yet. Rose Gilbert is WPLN's general assignment reporter. You can find the link to her story in today's post at thisisnashville.org. Rose, thanks for being here. And as always, thanks for your reporting. Thank you, Khalil. We have to take a short break. When we come back, we'll meet the founders of the local hip-hop crew, 6-1 Tribe, and learn what inspired them to form the collective. Are you a fan of 6-1 Tribe? Tweet us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Funding for This is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil Colonna, and this is Nashville. The hip-hop crew 6-1 Tribe is Artist of the Month over at our sister station, WNXP, but they've been making waves for a while now. Earlier this year, they took their talents to South by Southwest, and this week, they'll be making an appearance at Bonnaroo. So, how did the collective get started? And how do they keep up with all 16 members? That's right, you heard me right, 16 members. My next guests can break it down for us as they are the founders of 6-1 Tribe. G-Slab is an MC and local stalwart in the hip hop community. And Aaron Dethridge is an engineer and studio manager. G-Slab, Aaron, thanks for being here. Welcome to This Is Nashville. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Really great. So how are you both doing today? Good. 
Yeah, ooh, great. Ooh. It's a really wonderful day. All right, so congratulations on Artist of the Month. Thank you. I, I, I want to hear really from both of you on this. You know, you've been working and making music on your own terms for a long time now. How does it feel to be breaking through to a new tier of exposure? G? Um, grateful, because the, the, the journey's been long, but it's uh, it's refreshing, and I think it's the perfect time for it. I think the time has always been what we look for. And you stay fast, and you keep going, and you keep going, and you mm -hmm. keep going. And that's the thing about any career path or any journey. You're gonna, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be, and we took the road less traveled. Mm -hmm. I think it's always going to be a little more, a little more tren uh, tren tenuous in certain that way. So just happy to be here now. Mm -hmm. Aaron? Aaron. Um, yeah, I am definitely grateful. Definitely, um, I, you know, as someone that has been in Nashville for a long time, I've always really gravitated towards things like this that try and show off the, the part of Nashville that you only see if you live here, you know? Uh, Nashville has a reputation that I don't think um, really does a good job uh, of allowing the world to see what actually exists here, you know? Mm. It, it kind of oversimplifies to something that I don't even think is real. And um, I, I feel like our mission has always been to capture something real and authentic um, that the city needs. And uh, I, I feel like we have preserved that. And so to be getting exposure for that just feels very um, validating mm -hmm. because, you know, uh, the, we always knew that this was something special. Uh, it just wasn't what uh, people were looking for yet. Mm -hmm. now, now, you know, let's go back for a second. You know, Slab, you've been on the scene for a long time now in the hip hop scene. What was it like when you first got started? <laughs> um, it was always rappers here. It's always been influential people here from the Young Bucks to the Star Leados to even back in the day in the 80s to the uh, Pistols, um, Cool Daddy Freshes and people like that. Um, but before the 2010 era of music and stuff like that, there was no scene mm. here. There was no actual group of artists that could go places and be recognized. Oh, it's an actual thriving talent pool of, of people there in this genre, hip-hop and R&B, um, that exists. So for me, when you're in it, you don't know because you're in the forest. Mm -hmm. and, but when you step back and where I'm at, met now, we created something special. We, we allow, we we put a lot of forefather work in um, to build pillars to where we're at now in the community, to where it is stepping out now from 6-1 Tribe to the Days Me Bride to the Tim Jens to the Two Live Breeze to just whatever we're doing to even the A-Round personality being a radio personality and branching the hip-hop community in, in the quote-unquote Cashville feel of the city into the mainstream spectrum now. Now, so, in, in March, we had an episode about hip-hop, uh, some of the, the old-school hip-hop scene. I was talking to e e Eric from... Love noise. Mm -hmm. They had that, you know, it's the 2010s. So you're talking about the lack of venues and opportunities for folks. What were the opportunities like to get studio time to make music like back then? One of my first shows, I paid to perform to, to get studio time. You paid to perform? 2008, nine. I paid to perform to do a competition to get a free beat, to get studio time, and something mix and master, like all the whole, the whole package type thing. That's how hard it was. That, okay. that it was the lack thereof was so sparse that if you found someone, you just wanted to hold them dear. Mm -hmm. um, and over time, people, the the it became easier to produce music in your house because just technology and what we came to just in the world in general. And that started opening up more. But a lot of people got more access. Mm -hmm. People started got to know some guys who got into getting studios on Music Row, um, doing hip hop and stuff like that. The underground was down there for a while. Um, and it became stuff like that. But what we have now is light years ahead of what, what, what I started being able to do. There was nothing that you could do like Eastside Manor or just any other studio that I, uh, that people work out of nowadays is light years. Now, Aaron, I understand you studied at Belmont, right? Yeah, I did. Uh, 2007 to 11. Was hip-hop production something that <laughs> you were interested in at the time? Uh, it really wasn't. And, you know, honestly, I, I don't want to speak too badly about Belmont now because I, I haven't been there in so long. I don't know how it's changed, but I mean, just the, the culture of the school in general didn't have a lot of respect for hip hop. You know, I was, mm -hmm. I was an honor student that kind of split my degree between the school of music and the school of music business. And so I kind of got to see both sides of it. 
And, um, you know, this was back when Kanye was interrupting Taylor Swift at the awards and mm -hmm. things like that. And hip hop just had this um, reputation among the the school and, and the, the types of, you know, Southern academic white students that are the majority of the Belmont um, school group that it was just something that even as I was like developing interest in hip hop, um, it was something that I kind of kept to myself because it was not something that mm -hmm. a lot of my friends like shared um, mm -hmm. and, and was something that I definitely feel like I explored more freely outside of college and outside of kind of like the, the boundaries of that ecosystem. Um, I, I, I loved Belmont. I love a lot of the music there. Uh, you know, shout out to some of my classmates. Uh, Diarrhea Planet is playing the the Ryman tomorrow, and they, they were a band that formed at Belmont in those years. And, mm -hmm. you know, they, there's a lot of really special stuff that happened there. But looking back at it, um, it, it really wasn't appreciated or, or understood at all, despite, you know, being a school that... Um, and being programs that dissected music and lyricism and in Music City. At yeah, that. I, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I, I was taking songwriting yeah. classes that would dissect, you know, the the meaning and the the depth of all these lyrics and looking at hip hop. Now I'm just like, this is such an obvious like lane. You know, mm -hmm. there, there there's so much important storytelling at the root of hip hop. And uh, none of that was represented when I was back there, for sure. I find that really interesting because I, I was in college in the early 90s to the mm -hmm. mid 90s. And hip hop is something that kind of brought us together. People who listen to different forms of mm -hmm. music. We all came together yeah, yeah. and from different cultural backgrounds because of the hip hop that was happening yet here. And people were open about it yet. And it here at this prominent music school in Music City, it was kind of bifurcated. But it's a microcosm yeah. of the city. Ah. It's just, that's just a microcosm. Belmont and his experience it's just a microcosm of what he said about the over, over uh, simplified vision of what Nashville is, mm -hmm. of Southern whites, Broadway, country music guitars, and they hide what's here of the actual meat and potatoes of the actual city, the actual culture, the actual soul of the city. They hide. Music City is called Music City because of the Jubilee Singers at Fisk. Mm -hmm. It's not called Music City because of somebody who played guitar. Johnny Cash. It's not. It's not. It's not. And I, we, I, I listen to Johnny Cash. Yeah. That's yeah. not why we're called what we're called. That's not the representation that we we bred it here, and it's been stifled because of those type of ideologies that try to bury what we have here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Aaron, you know, you're into different music. Mm -hmm. You're finding hip hop contrary to popular belief. I know from personal experience, hip hop production is not easy. At all. No. <laughs> what was that learning curve like for you? Uh, I mean, there were certainly bad mixes along the way. Um, and I, I think the important thing for me was always trying to um, really recognize my strengths and weaknesses and find people that complemented my weaknesses. You know, I, I don't make a lot of the beats for this. Like, I, I produce a little bit, but my strength has always been in helping people present creative ideas to their fullest potential. And um, trying to take myself out of the creative process a little bit and be more on the technical side and the managerial side. Um, I definitely do a little bit of both. But, um, yeah, you know, for me, it was really about networking more than anything. I, there was definitely personal growth and, you know, learning how to do it better every time you do it. Um, but a lot of it's just meeting people along the way that help make it better. You know, meeting producers that sound the way you want your music to sound, meeting MCs that can get on those beats and really doing something with them. Um, I, and kind of with everything, I, I feel like the more you get right at, at that stage, the easier the mixing and, and like mm. the final product is. And I, I think that's where the real growth has been, is who, like the, the gel. Who handles the majority of, of the production? We have a, a, a slate of about ten to twelve producers okay. that that work with us. Just vibes, um, um, ghost. Are they all um, local? Yeah. Yes, yes. Everybody that we 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 do this is all Nashville based. Everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So everybody in Six One Tribe was either raised, born and raised here, or have been here so for a significant amount of time that it's their second home. Okay, so we've got a MC from the East Side. Yeah. We've got a producer from Belmont. Mm -hmm. It kind of feels like a, since you're in college and you're in the East Side, it feels like a Russell Simmons, Rick Rubin situation starting <laughs> Def Jam to me. Yeah. You know, how did you two meet? Well, share some of those memories for me, Slab. Um, shout out to Mario Dion. Um, he was one of the people that Aaron originally met in the city. 
um, hip hop artist and a community activist um, that he met in the city. He was doing something with him, and then he met Corduroy Clemens. Um, and then Corduroy brought me over for a session. He's like, I'm working on my album. Um, Corduroy hadn't done a project in a while. He's like, I'm working on something new. I want you on the project. Um, I'm at this studio. It's crazy. Come to the come to this place. Move on. So, so what's that? They say it's, it's out east. It's like it's right right around the corner. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and we went in there, and when I walked in, it was like I always tell people when you go to the studio, it's like going to uh, going to Narnia. It's like it's like <laughs> going to Narnia. Yeah, it's like literally going to like what's the train? The train here probably hopped on like yeah. nine nine and a half. Like it's like oh, going yeah. to like going to the new world. Um, so for me, that that's what that that first kind of expression was. That it was just something new and something fresh. And I had been manifesting something like that for the last two years. Right when we first started doing these things, I had put a project out um, presented by me and um, Dates One Thomas of Vibe Magazine um, that. Um, highlighted a whole bunch of Nashville artists at one time, about a 16 project thing, but because of the pandemic and mm. the, uh, the tornado and stuff like that, we couldn't get people in the studio. And, um, and I did that probably two, three months before I met Aaron and then met him. And then over time, it just became a, a, a budding relationship um, far, as far as that. We had a similar visions. Like we really were trying to do the same thing just from different vantage points. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah, so it does seem weird that the dude from Belmont and the the rap from out east is like uh, uh, partners, but it works like one of the best things ever. Because, like he said, he found someone to highlight uh, to help his weaknesses. I found someone to help mine. Uh huh. Uh, and and we do business very on a very even scale because the respect and the love we have for each other in general. But the the mentality for us is that we can we want to go to as big as possible we can go. You know, that, that, that collective mindset that you all have and then what you're taking has really, really worked out well for the crew. All kinds of performers from all over. They go to South by Southwest to try to build buzz. It's a pretty big deal for a Nashville hip-hop collective to make an appearance there. Let's hear a little bit of what it was like back when you were there a few months back. All right, Slap, what's happening there? Paint the picture for us. Oh, uh, one of uh, our artists, um, Andre Wolf and um, Rio Tokyo, they had a, a, a set back to back with each other um, at uh, Side by Southwest. Shout out to DJ Chill. Uh, he'll put, it, uh, put that on for us. Um, and that's Andre Wolf performing right there. And he's just vibing out. The crowd is full, it's packed out. It's one of our last shows we did that, that, week, that weekend. Um, it's a full, full house. And after that, he performs, we get on stage. I mean, we get off stage and they start playing me. We start vibing and stuff like that. Even DJ even said, I can tell it's a Tennessee party in here and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. we made an impact. I mean, one of, one of the biggest things we did, we moved as a unit majority through the whole thing. We had a full compound. We stayed together, ate together. We we really fellowshiped and grew as a as a unit there as well. It was our first trip out of, out of Nashville together mm -hmm. to prove that this wasn't just a concept that we felt confident about, that it can translate into a bigger market to people that's not our friends. Aaron, how did that feel to be there after all these years of hard work that y'all put we were putting in? Uh, it was great. I, it was certainly stressful. It was certainly a learning experience. But, you know, the we all stayed in one house. You know, we had, what, 28, 30 people yeah, in that. one Airbnb. Oh, wow. Uh, it was the, a compound. It was two separate little things. But yeah, it was like, yeah. It was I, I mean, a still, 14 bedroom house yeah. or something like that. Oh, but wow. I mean, we still had people be. sleeping on I, the that couches. That sounds like fun. Can I be in six uh, rooms? I mean, I mean you hey, have me. Hey, hey. We are nothing if not fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nothing else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it was great. It, it was a lot of networking. You know, we met people from record labels, from Netflix. We met other artists, and you know, we international artists, LA artists. Um, I feel like Nashville, when I first started trying to get into this, had a reputation of um, the hip hop scene being kind of like a step behind, you know, kind of people saw it as like a cornier thing or, or like a younger thing, like a, a more um, infant version mm -hmm. uh, of a uh, hip hop scene. And um, this definitely dispelled any feelings of that, you know, being around people from Atlanta, L.A., Amsterdam, New York, and mm -hmm. um, having them all really like notice, want to work with us, really want to interface with us, um, uh, allowed me to know that th this is as 
special in in kind of like the global sense mm. as, as it feels. Um, yeah, it, it was awesome. I, I I would do South by every month if we could. Yeah, no, <laughs> if we had the money and yeah, the... yeah, yeah, facts. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you're just tuning in, this is Nashville, and I'm your host, Khalil Ekelona. We're talking this hour about the local hip hop collective Six One Tribe with the co-founders G Slab and Aaron Dethridge. Treat us your comments at This Is Nashville. Now, Slab compared Eastside Manor to Narnia. <laughs> you know, I and I wonder, like, how does this how does it help there, this having this lush, rich environment? Aaron, talk to me about this. How does it help to create and produce music there? Um, I So I've been working out at Eastside Manor for like 12 years. Um, I, I can really talk about that spot for forever. Um, but I, I mean, I guess I'll just say, for me, the, the basis of this idea came from the... Uh, the Dreamville record, uh, Revenge of the Dreamers 3, where they put on like a week-long rap camp at a recording studio and invited hundreds of artists and producers out there to just come collaborate and make music together. And I wanted to create a similar environment um, for the Nashville hip-hop scene um, in order to kind of like funnel all of this talent into one exposure point for people. And uh, having a spot like the Manor really allows us to, you know, we'll have sessions with 20, 25 people all kind of coming together. 40? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, but I mean, we, we, will, we will gather together a lot of people to collaboratively work. And being in a comfortable environment where everybody can kind of lock in, um, can, can feel very connected and a part of something like that is not, you know... Uh, something that any place can offer it is not something that I could offer if I wasn't here, you know, e even with the same level of, um, technical expertise and, you know, a desire to do this, having the, the space to facilitate it has really allowed us to make this as communal as it's become e every part of it. We try and keep very, um, yeah, communal I, and shared. I, I can imagine it's an, a prime opportunity for growth between the artists to collaborate and bounce ideas off yeah. of each other, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, mean, we have... Uh, fast, so, yeah. fast. I mean, the, the growth happens very quickly, too, because the, the environment just breeds that. Mm -hmm. It breeds you want to be better because that's per the person that just came in the booth they went crazy. You, they, yeah. they, they did their thing. So you want you just want to be on that same level and, and, and expertise with them as well. All right. So we talked about 16 members. There's a lot of people. Hmm. Can you guys list off all the members? And as I say no, that, don't, don't Slab is don't grabbing no, no, for we his can phone. Do it. Don't get your phone. We you guys it. can do it without the phone. 16's a lot. All right. Let's let's see. Hey, I, 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 I'll trade you. We'll go back and forth. G Slab. Aaron Dethers. <laughs> okay. <that's>, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rio Tokyo. Cool Rick Lemons. Uh, Cashmere Cruel. H.B. Mandela. <laughs> uh, we, we really should have pulled up the list. I told you. Uh, so we're getting the phone Yeah, now we got Black Whistle. We have uh, West End. To make it go faster, just yeah, so you yeah, go faster. Negro Justice. Real Tokyo, Black Whistle, Quay, Andre Wolf, The Real Stepson, The Mirror Blade, Ronnie Rex, H.B. Mandela, Evan Gray, 30 Cells, West End, Negro Justice, Corduroy Clemens, Intellect, Trip God, Cashmere Crew, um, Peso Taxon, Mac, Miranda, and then yes, we have that's that's, that's the full yeah, unit that's, team that's, of the the videographers, the the, the yeah, crew, yeah. everybody who well, goes just into kind, the kind of that's not, kind of, even, that's not the producers. I didn't, I didn't producers. Yeah. I didn't any producers. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that that's a whole separate yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do for that. Okay, so you all have dubbed yourself the Wu Tang of the South. Why did you choose that description, Aaron? Um. So the the day that I kind of had this idea, I was the day I found that Dreamville record, and I watched an episode of Hip Hop Evolution, the mm -hmm. Netflix hip hop documentary about the Wu Tang Clan. And the thing that really jumped out to me about their model was the idea of creating a group with the intention of making the individual members of the group superstars outside of the group. You know, Wu Tang always wanted, uh, you know, Jizza to be a successful solo artist, always wanted Method to be a successful solo artist. And so we we wanted to bake in the mentality that like the group's function is building brand recognition for the individual artist. You mm -hmm. know, the group is a conduit for discovering a music scene of 16 individual artists, not 
just the group music. And so that is the thing about the Wu-Tang Clan that really jumped out to me. It was both like the unity of all these people from different backgrounds and different styles coming together to make a cohesive project, but also the goal being individual recognition and success for all of them. You know, all of you have your own unique style and G-Slab, let's hear one of your traversions, reverses actually from a, a tribe group track. Here you are on Sky Is Not The Limit. Charisma of a killer looking like a brick In the kitchen with the pots like I'm cooking grits My chest froze, just surrounded by an igloo And love don't cost a thing but the rent do and the rent do I'm cut from a fabric, they don't make it mass Look, paper of the plastic, I'm still in my bag Pretty women in my mission, she peep a winner A long way from dollar menu, nugget chicken dinners Humble beginners, I ain't really get enough of living First time in the ocean, now I see it different Got some head in the coop and sweated out of weed My real life is more wavy than a Twitter feed Superstars are your and like birdies, but they under par. The main event and you just the undercard. I really want it better for but they want it for You know, you can really hear the hunger yeah. in your voice there. How how was working with all these new collaborators in the collective? How has that influenced your style and flow? You've been around for a minute, and I'm sure you've evolved over the years. The the collaboration breeds um trying to be better and trying to try different things things that you wouldn't normally put in your in your in your uh, hole of things that you do you hear something might influence you. there's a lot of influence i think from all parties so it it definitely makes me want to try different things try to be uh more unique different flows, different cadences. Let's try to harmonize this. Let's mm -hmm. put a beat break right here. Let's put a bridge right here. It definitely makes the song creation uh, more uh, purposeful and intentional now. Now, you're making art together. It can be a very beautiful experience, but the business of music can really, let's just say, muddy things up. We're on the radio. Um, <laughs> especially when there's like a large number of people in the mix. What type of business model do you all use to ensure that each member of 6-1 Tribe gets their fair share um so with the collective music that we make um uh, we we just try to be very democratic with all of it if you're on the song you are an equal part collaborator with everybody else on the song yeah the producers the songwriters the musicians everybody is treated equally uh it, it's our belief that the music doesn't exist without everybody who's on it and um, there's no point in trying to no one person is yeah. more than the next person Yeah, in, there's in no point in of. trying to split hairs about whose contribution was more important because everybody's contribution was necessary for the thing to exist mm -hmm. and so um, you know we we take different approaches when we're working on solo records with people we always want the artist to maintain creative control mm -hmm. and majority percentages of their stuff but when we're doing um, solo records our, our desire is for everybody to be treated um, as if every part of the the process is equally important. Yeah. Um, you know, we are certainly figuring out a lot of this on the fly. Um, it, it is not even really what we intended. Uh, Originally, no. Yeah, for this to be um, when, when we started it. And so a lot of it is just kind of figuring it out. But the mentality has always been, you know, if we are as fair to every person as we can be, um, then... Anyone that has a problem with it is coming from a place of, you know, feeling a, a above someone else. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a conversation that we can have with them, you know. That's but a very, we don't want to create that no. setting. That, that's a unique perspective in yeah. the music business to be as fair to everybody <laughs> as absolutely possible. You guys are revolutionary just for that. Now, let me ask you this. You know, what does it mean to you to be part of a collective that's really helping to Create greater awareness, not just for the groups of the collective, but the hip hop scene here in Nashville. G. Um, that's I think that's our our first goal was that first before we said we we're gonna start a business, before we was going to make this a full fleshed out thing that we have now. Our goal was to help Nashville hip hop. Mm -hmm. That was the original goal, and it's still the that's still the the, the forefront of everything, is to make it so that people in the world don't feel like it's a drop off when they hear Nashville music, because it's not. The production is just as good. It's just getting the word out and getting people's ears uh, to, to the people. 
Mm -hmm. um, so that's when then that's still the focus is, is Nashville hip hop. That was G Slab and Aaron Deathrich, co-founders of Six One Tribe, June's Artist of the Month for our sister station WNXP. Congratulations to you both, and thank you for coming on to the show, fellas. I appreciate thank you. this. Thank you for having us. We have to take a short break. When we come back, we'll meet three more members of Six One Tribe and hear about their journeys to becoming a part of the influential collective. Join the conversation by tweeting us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Khalil Colonna, and this is Nashville. We are highlighting the hip-hop collective 6-1 Tribe. Based out of Nashville, the group of 16 members, each with their own unique style and voice. And each has their own path to joining the collective. For more on what it's like to be part of this sprawling crew, I'd like to introduce hip-hop artists and 6-1 Tribe members, Kashmir Cool. Rio Tokyo, Kashmir, Kashmir Cruel, pardon me, Rio Tokyo, and Corduroy Clemens, a.k.a. J-Dot, to the show. Fellas, thanks for being here. Welcome to This Is Nashville. Thanks for having Thank us. What's up? What's so, up? so real quick, I want to learn how long y'all have been a part of 6-1 Tribe. Cash? Um, I want to say joined right around last year. Last yeah. year? So yeah. about a year in. Rio, how about uh -huh. you? Uh, I've been here since its inception. Yeah. An OG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, J Dot. I was uh, with the Inception as well too, uh, along with Rio and uh, a few others. Okay, so you know, Cash, tell me, what was it like? What was life like before you became a part of Six One? Were you really actively making music at the time? No. <laughs> what were you up to? Um, so the thing is, uh, a lot of people just told me I should have been rapping because I'm good at just you know talking mess, and uh, I was like, nah, that's that's stupid. And then one day I was just like, eh, well, you know, why not? You know, COVID happened. And then Slab was like, dude, you should do it. He was one of the people that was definitely like, you know, you should do this. And from then on, it's just been happening. What was, okay, so when, when, what was it like when you first seriously started sitting down to write verses? Um, I just sat down and told the truth, and it just kind of came easy. Mm. Yeah. Okay, kind of a natural. I guess so. Yeah. All right. So, you know, you were pretty new to making music involved with Tribe. Let's get a listen to what you brought to the track in Tribe We Trust. Let's hear it. Leave no witnesses. I mean your job. Well, I own black business. If it's mine and my learning comes limitless. Limitless. I ain't go to no power limiters. Yeah. Watch your mouth when you speak on us. We some five star and keep that heat on us. Yeah. This that rich funk how the Eli must. And I put it on my soul. And try we trust. Look, your chose up. Why you mad at us? They loving what we got and how it add on up. Just that pure dope shit. Never had no bump. And I put it on my soul. And try we trust. You know, I hear a little bit of Snoop. In the, in the flow in your voice. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got, I got, um, I yeah. got West Coast roots. Yeah, yeah. That's, they, that's also like my, my third favorite rapper. A ain't nothing so, wrong with that. You know, yeah. there's a lot of laid back confidence in your delivery. How has being a part of Tribe helped you find your voice? Um, it's like working with all your cousins. Mm -hmm. You know, like you, like you and y'all had a, remember back in the day, you had a big old sleepover at Granny House and everybody stayed in the living room. Yeah. And everybody acted like they was comfortable sleeping on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what it's like. It's that same energy. Like, they just bounce. Everybody bounces off of each other. Yeah, family. Yeah, yeah. and also, um, mm -hmm. I was really channeling um, Kanye on Down and Out. With that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that was that was my inspiration. All right. Now, you know, hip hop legend Guru of the group Gangstar has a song that talks a, a lot about how the voice is one of the most important parts of being a quality MC or rapper, and having confidence. That's the key to coming off the way you want. Now, Corduroy Clemens, you've been writing about your experience of losing confidence and taking time away from music. By, and eventually finding your way back. Let's listen to a bit of the song Comfort Zone. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. 
strategy. I'm back up off sabbatical. It's corduroy to casual. Business as usual. Politics and afterthought. I ain't chasing afterthoughts in my past. I fall urges, splurges, still finding my purpose. I ain't gonna lie, I felt worthless. Prospects first then, me and my ex split. Next came the wreck then, I finally accepted that I'm just a vessel for the message. Uh, spread love, show game, and vice versa. Living la vida loca with my virtue. Yeah. They say the good die young, well my reply is to stay prayed up and hold my nine work up. Yeah. I like that. That's, yeah, that's, yeah. that's real, real. You expressing your heart right there. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. You use the word sabbatical. Tell me about that. Man, uh, I was making music for a little while, um, for a few years, came out with a couple projects. And then uh, I got married, had a son, and just life came and took a step back. Uh, I was doing a podcast for a little bit, just really lost the, uh, the joy of doing music. I was doing it for all the wrong reasons. And the tribe really is what got me back into doing music. So, You said you lost, you said something interesting to me. You lost the joy for music. I was mm -hmm. doing it for all the wrong reasons. Because a lot of times people say, I'm doing this for the love. Is it for the love of the music itself? Because that comes with tough times. Or is it for the love of the attention you mm -hmm. get? The potential money you get should you be a success, you know? Yeah. Talk to me a little bit more about that. Um, that's definitely what it was. It was, uh, I originally got into it because I just loved making music and... It got to a point where I was trying to trying to blow, trying to mm -hmm. get a viral song or get something something hot, mm -hmm. and it was I was chasing something that I didn't really like. So, like I said, I took a step back, uh, raising my son, just being a dad, being a trying to be a husband, and uh, like I said, the COVID came around and it was like, what do you really want to do? And just the opportunity came out, and here we are. How would you say that being a part of Tribe has helped your artistic voice? Um. Man, being at the manor, like we said, it's like a like a family reunion every time, but it's a blank slate. Like you can get out there and just really get your ideas out once you're in the manor. Uh, there's no judgment. Like it may be whack, but you you get a chance to get it out. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you just have a voice. Like you said, some it may be whack. You have people who will tell you it's whack. Oh yeah, you'll get out and be like. They'd be like, yeah, that ain't going to work. Get back in there, bro. Yeah. That ain't going to work for the song. Get back in there. Nah, or that ain't, ain't going to work. And how important is that? Because a lot of times you have people who are like, serve as yes men or yes women. Like, oh, yeah, anything it's, it's you none do is fresh. But, but, it's, but it's all respect, though. It's, uh -huh. it's, it's mm -hmm. constructive criticism. Like, still start from still. So, okay. I mean, it's just a good vibe. All right. Now, Rio Tokyo, you've released some of your first music through 6 1 Tribe. This is true. Let's hear a little bit of your RB side. Here's the song Cool Breeze. <laughs> You look like my wife to be my type of dream And like it's a crime to leave no right for me We've been on a wake up, shake some We ain't got my cake up, make one Open up, you should be my only one Stuck, they mad when they know you won Don't give a f no, hit it like a hole in one And it's up, tell them, tell them simmer down I'm in the clouds Tell them that I'm bigger now, make them, make them bounce Got you when you're feeling now that I'm winning wild And summertime music right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's it like? Like leaning into what makes you an individual, right? But you're also able to lean into <clears throat> in with so many different like collaborators in the collective. Uh, man, one thing my Uncle Jimmy always told me is be an individual among many. So that just mean wherever you at, be you, but be able to, you know, morph and blend in with the crowd need be. What's, where's the name Rio Tokyo? Where'd you get inspired to come up with that name? Um, it, 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 that could be a two-part answer. So one is just the Rio de Janeiro, you know, there, there's just two places I love just in the world, and then another one is just from from this show I was watching called uh, Money Heist. Money Heist. Yeah. 
That was the inspiration. The, the two uh, love interests, that's their names, oh. Rio and Tokyo. Okay, okay. Now, if you all are just tuning in, this is Nashville. I'm your host, Khalil Ekelona. We're talking this hour with three members of the local Hip Hop Collective 61 Tribe. Tweet us your comments at This Is Nashville. Now, 16 people in a room, that's a lot of voices. <laughs> yeah. When creating something, <laughs> sometimes people talk about too many cooks in the kitchen or too many producers in the booth. 16 people is a lot. Rio, tell me, how do you take those voices and suggestions? And add that to your style. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't even think I do that. But if if that's how it comes across, then that means I'm doing my job right. Okay. But I just always try to do me first. And if it, if it can blend well with what everybody else got going on, then that's perfect. Who are some of your major musical influences? Uh, Lupe Fiasco, um, Tupac. Um... I'm going to say Wayne. I'm going to say Currency. Currency. Yeah. Lil Wayne. Those are all, everybody you listed there, some straight-up MCs. Yeah, goats. And, um, you know, we were talking earlier in the previous segment about Eastside Manor. Famous, iconic studio that you guys work in. It's my Walk favorite in. place in the world right now. What was oh, it like? I want to hear from all <laughs> you. Cash, tell me first. What was it like when you walked in for the first time? Um, So, I grew up in Inglewood, right? And... Uh, we used to hear, like, as kids, we used to hear, like, you know, this mansion in Inglewood, and everybody be like, you lying. And then I got invited. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. You got invited, Phil. felt yeah. like going to a oh, mansion. Oh, um, just to say to the comment of, uh, you know, the whole too many cooks in the kitchen, if uh, anybody has anything to say about that, I just want to let you know that we're all eating. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> now, good. now, Corduroy, I mean, that place, what makes that place so different from the other studios you've visited? Man, uh... I think it starts with Todd Nona, the owners. Like, it's just a welcoming environment, and that, like, trickles down to everybody else. And, I mean, you got one of the best sound engineers, like, so your sound's going to be right. Like, it's just a overall great experience from top to bottom. I, I wonder, you know, what you all are looking for. Like, when you're cycling through beats, you know, they were just telling us earlier in the previous segment, a lot of producers y'all mm -hmm. work with. So when you're looking, Rio, when you're looking for a track, what do you, what do you, what's in your ear? What are you trying to hear in beats and tracks that you work on? Um, Whatever grabs me, really, most of the time. Because, like, my writing process is backwards. Like, my, my verse is done before I'm even picking a beat. So okay. It's like whatever's fitting that or whatever... Like I said, whatever's grabbing me when I when I hear it. So you like to have your verses written, and then you get on to, you find a track, you find the emotion and the color that matches that? Yeah, I wake up in the morning and write, man. Okay, every day? Yeah, I mean, not every day, but, you know, when it hit me. Yeah, I feel that. You know, we all know that hip-hop is real competitive, highly mm -hmm. competitive. Is the scene here, total in Nashville, is the scene, do you think the scene is a collaborative one or a competitive one? Cash. No comment on that one. No comment <laughs> on that one. Yeah, yeah. You got to be clean, you know? What about yeah. you? It's a little bit of both. Uh, there is friendly competition. There's people that's uh, stepping on other people's toes. And then there's the collaboration. Like, it's people that's, uh, like, we got this, the tribe. We got what we're doing over here. But you also got Black City. Those are, I mean, those are our brothers as well, too. We got other people around. So it's it's getting real collaborative at the moment, real uh, just Everybody's trying to go to the same goal is like uplift Nashville. Uplift Nashville. Why do y'all think that it's important that the rest of the music world, a lot of times when we think about hip hop, we think of the United States. But honestly, hip hop is a global music and mm -hmm. has been for a long time. Mm -hmm. Why does the music world need to hear from Nashville hip hop artists? Rio? Um, for one, what everybody need to know is like everybody y'all love come here to make music. Everybody y'all love come here to shoot their Thanks. videos and shoot their movies and shoot their TV shows and all of that. So a lot of that stuff starts in Nashville and it's time to actually, you know, put the light on it and let people know what's going on here. All right. So y'all have gained a new level of exposure this year. Facts. You got South by Southwest. Mm -hmm. You got Bonnaroo coming up. People are releasing projects. I want to hear about what you guys have planned left. We have basically basically a minute left. Corduroy, what's next? Um, we got the album coming up soon. I think it's what June twenty seventh when it comes out. Yep, yep. We Reset that the rejects, man. Yeah, so that's gonna be real big. We got videos, of course, visuals, more performances. 
Um, we got individual projects. Uh, Ronnie Rack's got hers coming up. We, we got a lot of stuff in the works. Cash, what can we be on the lookout for in the years to come from the 6-1 Tribe Collective? Um, look, we're going to be dabbing into everything. That's just how we operate, <laughs> you know? So we got, you know, shows coming up all over the place, you know? Whoever's listening that might be outside of the city, look for your city or just call us and ask, you know, just come through, you know? Make it worth it. And, um... Uh, everybody's doing their own thing. Shout out to Ronnie Rack. She's putting out some beautiful, I already know. Facts. And, um, you know, this is the, as the year goes on, you're just going to see us grow even further. Is there a global tour potentially coming up in the next couple yeah, of years? Yeah, man, that's what we want. That's, that's really what the big goal is, is to keep growing and keep expanding and to actually go where the demand is. So, yeah. yeah. Hip-hop's yeah. turning 50 this year. Anything special y'all are looking forward to? I just love how, because uh, hip hop's such a young genre, so seeing hip hop develop like rock music, where you got your older artists and just the, the varying range of ages and everything like that. So it's, it's cool seeing hip hop grow. All right. That was 6 1 Tribe member Corduroy Clemens. He was joined by fellow 6 1 Tribe members Rio Tokyo and Cashmere Cruel. I want to thank you all for being here. Keep thank making you. music. Keep thank making Nashville proud. Thank all you. right. This was cool, man. I appreciate you. Really, thanks. Tribe. And thanks, thanks to you for listening in this hour. This is Nashville as a production of WPLN News and Nashville Public Radio. Today's episode was produced by Julie Height. Our senior producer, Producer is Steve Harouche. Our digital lead is Anna Gallegos Cannon. Michaela Elias is our technical director. Our executive producer is Andrea Tutto. The masterminds behind our theme music are LaRange and Namir Blade. Listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get your podcasts. The conversation doesn't end here. Tweet us at This Is Nashville. Find us on Instagram and tell us what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil Ekelona. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. And be good to each other.